And I'm preaching today on this subject, the gospel for our city. And when they had preached the gospel to that city, that city, uh, verse number seven says, and there, there, they preached the gospel, speaking uh, of Lystra. And so the apostle had this habit of going into cities and uh, giving them the gospel. Now, we have before us today the second half of Paul's first missionary journey. Some believe he made three. Others believe he made four. But here he is accompanied by Barnabas, who was a, a teacher uh, from the church at Antioch. The Antioch church was a very powerful church, and we should pattern ourselves in the New Testament after this great church. When it was planted, the people in that city there began uh, to uh, call them, uh, the folks that had put their faith in Christ, they called them Christians. They were called Christians first at Antioch, where we get our name. That means little imitators of Christ. Uh, by the way, that's a good way to get a church started, uh, following Christ. Christ is all we need. And uh, uh, they were strong on the gospel. They were gospel focused, you might say, aware of their city, intentionally giving out the gospel every day from house to house. And they were, that is the Antioch church. Uh, they were a mission church, sending out people from amongst them to do mission work. Acts 13 tells us that both Paul and Barnabas were commissioned uh, in uh, this church for mission work. They were not just uh, a, a strong church, gospel focused, and not only were they a, a mission church, but they were a pattern church. A lot of folks will call their church Antioch Baptist Church. Many times they leave their pattern there uh, and focus on something else, but it's a, a tremendous pattern church. The em emphasis of our text this morning is on a particular city, that city, one where these men stopped and preached the gospel and many came to Christ to the point that a church was started there. And that city was Derby. There are seven cities mentioned in this chapter, chapter 14, eight. If you include Antioch, their ascending church, they went back to, and let me say it like this by way of introduction. Every city is distinct, but their focus at the moment was on this one city. Previously, they had focused on Lystra, and before that, they'd focused on Iconium. And I want you to understand, every city is different. Our focus at Franklin Road Baptist Church is on our city. Our city is not San Leandro. Our city is not Nashville. Our city is not Knoxville. And let me just say this. Uh, you say, well, those are all cities in Tennessee. All the cities are different. Nashville is full of wealthy people and country western singers and all their bands and all their light and sound people. It's full of that. It is a metropolitan area uh, in our, but our city is not like that. We're a bedroom community. Uh, Knoxville is more uh, distinct in their southern traditions and all that. It is a large college town. Our city has spiritual distinctions. Uh, your city has spiritual distinctions. Unlike other cities, we are a very church city. San Leandro, San Francisco, this Bay Area, is a very unchurched city. And so they're distinctive. Uh, but uh, our church uh, uh, is a, sits in the church of dozens of churches, and even independent Baptist churches. And by the way, it just ticks me off when somebody comes to Murfreesboro area and wants to plant a church. You know what I tell them? I tell them, look, at least go to Nashville. At least go to downtown Nashville in that metropolitan area. Uh, anyway, uh, so uh, it, it, our, in our area, very church area, but listen, this, this may shock you, very little, if any, outreach. We are one of maybe two churches, three max, that knock on doors, that run buses, that try to get people to Christ. I'm not saying the others are evil. I'm just saying they don't do it. Us and the Jehovah False Witnesses. And uh, this is all in a, a, a time when most churches where I live were conservative churches, they're traditional churches uh, and all of that, but that's changed. We are one of the few traditional churches. We are the only uh, traditional church as far as larger churches. That means that our philosophy of ministry uh, still is old time way. We don't say it like that. We still believe in the old time religion. And uh, that's not just, just a foot stomping type religion. That means we believe in the old time way. 
The Bible is the word of God. The gospel is the only truth and all those things. And so most churches have moved uh, toward a contemporary model. Now, as we look at our verse this morning, I want you to see about eight quick things. And I'm going to, this is a very long introduction. And then the body of the message will be very brief and mostly review. I, I love to take a verse. I love to take a section of scripture, but especially a verse and break it down. And we're going to kind of dissect this verse right here, almost word for word. I want you to notice, please. And uh, let's, let's read the verse one more time. Uh, verse number 21. And when they had preached the gospel to that city and had taught many, they returned again to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch and Antioch. I want you to notice, please, first of all, the moment of the gospel the moment of the gospel. He says here, when and when and when they had preached the gospel, not if they preached the gospel, when they preached the gospel. That was the first thing they did. Uh, the time to give out the gospel is now, not later. Amen. Today is a day of salvation. Ladies and gentlemen, let me say it like this. This is our moment as a church. We don't have to wait for things to get worse. They're already bad. And uh, this is our time right now. This is the time to rise up and, and be the church they need to be. Uh, we need to be, you need to be in your city. Look, you can, worry about, uh, you can worry about Seattle or Portland. You can worry about LA and all those things and, and pray for them and maybe send a mission dollar here. But your city is San Leandro and those neighboring cities. I'm getting ahead of myself, but the moment of the gospel is now. Number two, we see the men of the gospel. We see the men of the gospel. The word here is, and when they. Well, who is that? Well, the Bible teaches us that the, Paul and Barnabas, and Paul was an apostle. That means he was an eyewitness of the resurrected body of the Lord Jesus Christ. He describes himself as the least of the apostles, as one born out of due time in 1 Corinthians 15, 8. That means this man had seen the Lord on the road to Damascus. A little unlike the other 12 disciples who became apostles except for Judas, but he comes along later on and sees the Lord. We sing that song, I saw the light, I saw the light. And, and, and he saw the light that day and he saw was one born out of due season, not the same as the others, but nevertheless, he was an apostle. And that was big because the other they, the other person here is Barnabas. Barnabas, on the other hand, was not an eyewitness of our resurrected Lord, but nonetheless willing to die for his faith as a believer in Christ Jesus. These men, Paul and Barnabas, were simply doing what they were taught to do. Let me just say it like this. You and I are the they. I am the they in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. You are the they in San Leandro. And that world around us are looking for the they, if I can say it like this, to come and tell them about Christ. You may say, well, I'm not the pastor. Well, Rudy, too, too. Every church has one pastor. And you, not be, you may not, not, I'm not suggesting he's an apostle at all. He's not. I am suggesting that he is a God-called man to this church. You may say, well, I'm not a God-called man. Well, you're the Barnabas. You're that teacher. You're that strong a soldier of God that God looked down on that church at Antioch and said, Paul, I want you to go. And I'm sending with you another man of God named Barnabas. And you and I should do all we can to grow into that position to be our Barnabas. And so uh, the they is mentioned. Number three, write this down. Or number four, I'm not sure what I'm, I can't count here. But uh, the a matter of fact, I just noticed I've got my, my, my numbers wrong. That we might just have seven. We could get out early today. Uh, we see the method. Well, what did they do? We see the moment of the gospel, the men of the gospel. And the Bible so shows us the method in verse 20. And when they had preached the gospel, when they had preached, the word preached means to her herald. It's like... Uh, you study American history, you'll run across a man named Paul Revere. During the Revolutionary War, he was a, he was a heralder. He was a man that rode horseback through the streets of the city, waking up the Minutemen, those that were ready to be called to arms at any moment, at any minute. And they, were, they boasted themselves to have their clothes ready, their guns loaded, and they could get ready in a minute to fight the enemy. And he went running through the city and he hollered out, the British are coming, the British are coming. He heralded a great truth and the men of that city would get ready to fight 
the enemy. Ladies and gentlemen, you and I, I'm not talking about just the preacher. You and I are called to be preachers to our area. And it is not a, it is not a light method of communication. They boldly proclaim the gospel or the good news uh, of Jesus Christ to others. Let me ask you this. Have you ever had a, a, a bit of news or information that you just could not wait to tell it? Maybe some stock or bond that Jesus, oh, wow, I'm going to tell someone they can make money. Maybe some vitamin or herb or some potion you can drink. By the way, I have had everything poured down me since I got arthritis in 1989. I've had green stuff run out the side of my mouth. I've took every nasty pill I could take. I'm going to tell you what, uh, I, I'm still sick. I, I'm, I'm a poor poster child for health food. <clears throat> but, but, but uh, you know, I mean, if every now and then I'll get on something. I was reading late last night about apple cider vinegar, and this doctor said, oh, you ought to take out. And so as soon as I get home, I'm going to take out. But you know what? <clears throat> we, we've got news, and we want to tell other people. But by the way, if I found out it works, I'll get you on it too. We like to tell news, but that's not how we give out the good, good news of the gospel. We are to preach it. We're to herald it. We're to be excited about it. We're to thunder it out. You say, I'm not a preacher. Yes, you're a preacher if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior. I'm warming up now. I'm not cold at all right now. We should be that way with the gospel. The first century church, if I could say it like this, was not familiar with the shyness, shyness and the backwardness of today's church. They were bold and fearless. They knew that preaching could cost them their head. And we may be moving toward that in, in this generation. I do not know. I, I hope I hope not, but nevertheless, when Christ comes back, he's, he says right here, he says, uh, verse 22, last part, that we must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. I, you know, I want you to understand. We really have got it made as Christians in our generation. Do you know that every place in the Bible, through the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and through all of Paul's writings and Peter, Peter's writings, do you know they are all under the oppressive thumb of Rome? And you know that many of those Christians were in prison and they all suffered persecution. Uh, the apostle himself persecuted. He'd take, a, he'd take the male Christian a man out of the family and he would haul him off to prison and some of those would be killed there. Stephen was stoned and, 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 he, and they laid his garment at the feet of the apostle Paul. He thought he was doing the Lord's work. As they pulled the man out of that house, all those little babies and those little kids and that wife had no income. They had no one to take care of them. That's the way it was. When we read the Bible. And so I again the message of uh, the, the, the method of the gospel was bold and fearless. And number four, we see the message. The message, the Bible says, uses the word the gospel. The death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Could you say that with me together? The good news. Ready? The death, burial, and resurrection. Say it again. The death, burial, and Say it real loud. The what? That is the gospel. You know, it hasn't changed for over 2,000 years now. That message, if we believe it, can have uh, eternal life. If we believe it, in a beautiful place called heaven. If we believe it, we'll get a new body. As preacher was saying there just a moment ago, the sun's coming up in the morning. By the way, I, I made a note of that. We're going to sing that when we get back home. It's in our songbook. We hardly ever sing it. My, my song leader's from the Northeast. God help us from New Hampshire. <laughs> and here we, I'm out here in California, the cereal state, the land of fruit, flakes, and nuts, and you are singing an old Southern song. <laughs> May God help us. Is everybody okay right now? I'm just kidding, kind of, sort of. <laughs> and so, uh, <laughs> yeah, if we believe it, we're going to get a new body. I have grease joints on all, of my, on all of my joints, and I grease them down. I used to spray WD-40 on my ankles. I don't do that. <laughs> Literally, someone told me that'll work. <laughs> uh, it sure does smell, I'll tell you that. <laughs> if we believe the gospel, we shall live forever. Yes. That's the message. That's right. you, you know, isn't it something? There's a lot of things you can tell people, but when you tell them, the gospel, you would think that that gift of God, which is eternal life, should say, oh, I want that. But the devil is busy blinding the minds of those lest they believe. And uh, so we see the message of the gospel. We see the mature, maturing, if I could say it like this. The Bible, look at this. You cannot leave this out. 
The Bible says, and when they had preached the gospel to that city and taught many and taught many. This is, this is nothing but straight up discipleship. And the church today in America is terrible at it. And we wonder why we're not reproducing. Even in, the, even in the, uh, the Great Commission, we're taught to win people to Christ, to baptize them and teach them to do the same. When I was growing up, your pastor and his wife would have been in the same generation. We probably didn't have a lot of what, what is called discipleship classes because people, when they got saved, they'd come to church for Sunday school. They'd come uh, Sunday morning. They'd come Sunday night. They'd come Wednesday night. And they, they'd go soul winning, knock on doors. And during all those events, I like what you said, three to thrive, four to thrive. I like what you said, five to thrive, six. I forget what happened. You go where the booger man is. Anyway, but, uh, <laughs> but, but anyhow, uh, my brain wonders. I've got graffiti painted on the inside of my brain and, and it will chase to certain things. I can't remember anything else. But anyhow, where was I? But uh, I was on point number uh, uh, five, the maturing uh, they taught. And, and, and back in those days, you were kind of taught by assimilation, if I could say it like this. You kind of accrued the information from the Word of God because you was always in church. And you're able to watch the lives of other people that live godly lives, and it's pretty easy. You kind of you acclimated to it, and that is not true anymore because some churches may only have one service a week, and many churches have no godly people, and people do not read their Bibles. I mean, when I was growing up, we, we literally had family devotions in our home. How about that? We memorized scripture. How about that? That's what, that's what our pastor, that's, it's not true today. And understand that there was a, a maturing process. The apostle knew how important it was to strengthen their converts quickly so they could survive in a brutal and pagan world of the Roman Empire. He knew these baby Christians would never make it without the teaching of the word of God. And let me say this, it's no different today. You have got to have the preaching and the teaching of this ministry, not because the preacher, not because the preacher, it's his job to do it. It's our job to set under gifted men of God and learn the word of God. You have a very humble pastor, but at the same time, uh, he's a very learned man of God. I was, I was reading the scriptures this morning. Uh, almost the last part of the book of Exodus from my morning Bible reading. And I was, I was listening to how the, uh, how the priest was supposed to prepare a certain sacrifice and how he would wash the legs and, and everything. It was just so detailed and how he would get that sacrifice ready to sacrifice for the people. You had the day of atonement sacrifice. You had the sin offering for the people and all those things. And there, that, that, that man of God stood between the living and the dead in those days, literally. And I thought, well, why does God go to such detail about this particular sacrifice? And here's how God spoke to Martin. I may be all wet. This is just this morning, fresh off the burner. I believe in, in my own life, there is so much preparation that I put in to just one sermon that the average person that's not called to do that will not do that. And I want you to know that every Sunday morning and every Sunday night and every Wednesday night, your pastor puts out hot bread for you and he's making a sacrifice in his study and on his knees preparing for what God has called him to preach. That day. And thank God for that. There is a maturing process. And let me just say it like this. The longer we wait to do our job in our city, the worse that city gets. I'm going to give a little observation. Statistics will probably prove me wrong. But I remember the first time I came to St. Leandro, I think this is my second, I think third trip here. I remember the first time I came. And uh, I remember every time I came to church, police had somebody pulled over. One guy they had across the car, they were cuffing him. And a uh, pastor was taking me back and forth to the hotel. He said, he said, Brother Norris, he said, we live in a very high crime area. I mean, I was literally scared to death. And uh, whenever he told me in text message I was coming out of the airport, he said, now we're going to give you a church vehicle so you can drive back and forth. I'm, I'd really rather be at the preacher. I really don't want to drive in Bay Area traffic, and I really don't want to be around anybody that's going to shoot me at a stoplight, you know? That's what I was thinking. 
little observation. I know statistics will probably prove me wrong, but I don't see what I saw then. I've yet to see the first police officer. Probably because they're not allowed to arrest anybody anymore. But anyway, uh, that's another story. But, uh, but I, I, don't, I don't see that. Everybody has been, have been so nice and so kind, and they even kind of let you over in the lane and all that. And I don't know, it's just a simple observation, but it could very well be that this church is a lighthouse in this city and God is holding back some wrath on this city because there's a church that wins souls. There's a church that teaches people the word of God. The maturing, this is introduction. I'm going to get the message in a moment. We see, we see number whatever I'm on, six, I think the movement, the movement. <laughs> there was a movement started here. Verse number 21, and when they had preached the gospel to that city and had taught many, they returned again to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch. This movement, they kept this thing called the gospel alive. They never stopped as preacher was quoting the apostle Paul, talking about how God had watched over him because that he continued. They had much persecution. They had many opportunities to quit and go home. In fact, you may not know this, but Derby. Paul at Derby, Paul was very close to his hometown of Tarsus, and he could have said, I'm done, I'm all washed up, and, and, and I'm headed home, but he kept on going. He made the circle again and went back and confirmed uh, souls in every city. Have you ever thought about where you, you and I would be right now as a people of God if those apostles were not successful at turning the world upside down in their generation? Where in the world would we be, be right now? You and I as American citizens would probably never have heard the gospel. But understand this, where would this city be right here if everything just closed up and people got mad at each other in this church and you couldn't get along and you stopped winning people to Christ and you, and you got focused maybe on the, some other program. Understand this, that this doors of this church would close, the gospel would be pulled out of this city and the city would collapse spiritually. You say, do you really believe that? I absolutely, I believe that. They tell me in California, there's hundreds of cities that have no gospel witness. And I'm sorry about this. I don't mean this in a negative way. But on the East Coast, they call, that, they call this the left coast. That's a derogatory statement. Because they watch the politics and the economy and everything in, in this state. And it's like that because they don't have a gospel witness like they need. I cannot emphasize enough the importance of you being in the city and being part of the movement. And uh, thank God for the movement that continues. I know we kind of get knocked around about, well, you know, fundamentals are not what it used to be and all that. You know, if you still believe in the fundamentals of the faith, it's still what it used to be. And lastly, we see the miracle here. Again, the Bible says, verse 23, he says, and, and, and he ordained elders in every church and prayed with fasting. Uh, the Bible says they, the, the miracle of this is they taught them they confirm the souls, not in the same uh, area as um, the Catholics do, but there is a, a confirmation process. Years ago, I was over in uh, Turkey, and uh, I went to the, where they, the ruins of the church at Ephesus were. Close by was another city where they believe the Apostle Paul came, came back to. He ended up on the Isle of Patmos and all that. Not Paul, but John, the Apostle John. And though the Catholics had kind of taken a, a, a hold of this particular church building, they, they called it the Church of, of the Apostle John. And he was buried somewhere underneath there, they said, and all that. I, I don't know if any of that's true. But here's what I noticed. As we went to the ruins of that church, and it was the ruins, we stood out in, a, in the middle of a rotunda about the size of this auditorium, maybe not quite this big. In the middle of that, in that rotunda was a, a, a stone hewn out, baptistry it had steps down into it and then around around the sides uh around the sides uh, there was these little uh cubicles with a little stone bench in them you can go right over there and see it yourself and some of you are going to google it anyway so i can tell you i'm telling the truth but anyway and uh, so i asked our guide who was a coptic christian i asked him and don't even ask him what th that is i mean I, he, he knew the gospel i witnessed him but anyhow i said what is this he said, well, this is the baptistry room. And I said, what are these little cubicles around there? I don't know how many. There's 10, 12 of them. 
He says, that's where the elders or deacons, pastors of the church would sit. And whenever a candidate for baptism stepped up to the stairs of the go down in that baptistry, which is right in the center, every one of those men would poll or question the candidate, have you trusted Christ as your Savior? Are you ready to die for Jesus Christ? Do you believe you're going to heaven? And they, they just confirmed. They, were getting, they would not baptize somebody who would not give a clear testimony. Now, look, look. I know, boys. I know how we are. Boys get to say, boom, they're down. They're back up, heading out. But Paul didn't do that. Because he knew it was going to take a lot to stand for God. And they, they ordained elders in every city. And a church was planted here in Derby. And let me just say it like this. Uh, and hear me well. Every church in every city is a miracle from God. Uh, it's a place where folks are saved. It's a place where they're baptized. It's a place where lives are put peace back together. It's a place of praise and worship to God. It is a house of prayer. It is a house of sweet fellowship. And thank God for every church that's a Bible-believing church. Amen. If I were you, I'd be very careful about speaking against what God hath wrought in this city. This is not a club. It's not a corporation. It's not a political action group. It is, this is not some union or other association. Those things will come. They'll go. This is a church of the living God. And from its inception until now, it remains one of God's many miracles in every city and every nation. It's a place filled with God's converts, a place where the members have been discipled and confirmed in their walk, a place that is to be the launching pad for the gospel to the lives of those that need to hear. Amen. To speak against the church is to speak against God. The church today may be misunderstood. It may be misused. It may be maligned. It may be mocked. But the Bible says the gates of hell should not prevail against the church. We are a shining city, a city set on a hill, a lighthouse that draws others off of the stormy sea of life. Amen. Annie Crosby wrote in her song, We Sang Up My Anchor Holds. And she said this, I think I've got it, I've thought about this, it's written in front of my Bible here somewhere, and uh, I'll never find it now. But she said, uh, she said this, and uh, anyway, I may have to just do the best. Um, she said, you'll never know the worth of an anchor until you feel the stress or the weight of the pole of the stormy sea. It's the place where our anchor holds. This is where you're a member. When I was a boy growing up, in my whole life, I've only been a member of three churches. I grew up in Evans, West Virginia. We had a church there nearby called the Grace Gospel Baptist Church. That church stopped giving out the gospel and and went a different direction. They couldn't keep a pastor. They fought all the time, so my mom and dad moved us down town to Ripley. When we joined the Ripley Baptist Temple. There I was called to preach. From Ripley Baptist Temple, I ended up pastoring that church, if you can believe that. From there, we moved to Franklin Baptist Church. Three, three churches we were members of. And uh, you may be saying, well, well, being a member of a church, get me in heaven. No, please don't count on that because if, if most churches keep membership roles like, like we keep them at our church, God never gets you up there because he can't find your name on the membership roll. But I was, part of a, I was part of a churches that were on fire for, for God. Now, the Bible says here, and when they had preached the gospel to that city, I'm going to give you three closing remarks, and I want you to jot these down. Number one, they faithfully preached the gospel to the city. It was a, that city, a specific city. Murfreesboro is our specific city. We have 57,000 doors that we knock and growing. I wish I could tell you we knock those doors three times a year. Uh, we're not as good at it as you are. But then again, I'm looking at a room full of soul winners. I'm sorry the South is like it is. I'm not making excuses. But we have a specific city. You have a specific city. And as you reach this city, you branch out. I like what you're doing. All of their focus and efforts at that time was concentrated on Derby. They, they went back to other cities and confirmed, but, but they had already been there soul winning and preaching, and now they're concentrating on this specific 
city. Nothing is said about programs. Nothing is said about specialized meetings. Nothing's said about debates. They just took every opportunity to preach the gospel to that city. And the reason for that is they realized the gospel was exclusive. Meaning this, John 14, 6, Jesus saith unto them, I'm the way, the truth, and life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Acts 4, 12, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Galatians chapter 1, verse 6, I marvel that you're so removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ and to another gospel, which is not another but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As I said before, I say it again. If any man preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have, you have received, let him be accursed. I'm just saying, I, I didn't say that. I, I, the apostle Paul said that inspired of God. There is no other gospel. And there's a specific gospel for specific cities all over this world. Number two, they focused on the people of the city. They faithfully preached the gospel to the city. They focused on the people of this city. So somehow, they had to t turn off what they experienced in Iconium. They, they, couldn't, they couldn't take what they had learned in the fired-up church at Antioch. Uh, they couldn't, uh, the, where they got beaten, thumped around in Lystra, they, they couldn't, they couldn't uh, worry about that. Now they're in Derby. When they rolled into Derby, they had this big open door. And Paul had been beat and thumped on. They left him for dead. Another place, they, the Bible says in uh, verse number uh, uh, three, it says, uh, verse number four, well, anyway, somewhere, uh, they, they stirred up, the Jews stirred them up. Verse 5, and when they, there was an assault made, both of the Gentiles and also the Jews with their rulers to use them despitefully and to stone them, they are aware of it and fled to Lystra and to Derby. Uh, verse number 19, they stoned Paul, drew him out of the city. Said, now, we're, we're, not, we're not at Lystra now. We're not at Iconium now. We're not in that great church at Antioch. We are in Derby. And in Derby, they built a great work of God because they didn't focus on any building. They had no buildings. They focused on the people. And what they focused on is because they had love and concern. The Bible says this in the book of Jude, uh, verse number 22. And some have compassion, making a difference. And others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garments spotted by the flesh. Ladies and gentlemen, please understand that you and I are, are going out into the city and we ought to pray to God in heaven for the fullness of the Spirit of God. But what we should do is focus on the person behind that door. Focus on that new person that comes inside the church. Focus on the people. Uh, they fear the judgment of hell. 2 Corinthians 5, 11. Know therefore the terror of the Lord. Uh, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. They had an acute knowledge of, of hell and they were aware of the return of Christ, which would end uh, the opportunity for any to be saved. This could be the last day for somebody you talk to. They were so conscious they focus on the people. And then lastly, they fervently persevered. They fervently persevered. The Bible indicates that they went to this city and this city and this city. And then when we were done there, they went all the way back around to Antioch where they were sent out of, stayed a long time there, rehearsed the doors that God had opened, Talked to them about the souls who were saved. Everybody got fired up at kind of like a big missions conference. Everybody got fired up. And later on, you'll find they left again. They packed their bags and took off again. They persevered. Paul was stoned, left for dead, but they persevered. Right. Later on, you'll find the guy was shipwrecked, floated the night and day on the board. You'll find everywhere he went, the Jews opposed him. You'll find one place he was snake bitten. And the list goes on and on and on. I tell you what, one snake in my life would send me packing right away. And he, he was beaten. He was in prison. You know what? He, when he got to Derby, he could all, almost smell the barbecue pit from Tarsus. And he could have said, look, I'm, I'm all shot up. 
I'm beaten. I've got, he had, he had an eye disease, most people believed, and, and sometimes he would write the scripture and he, would, uh, he had a penman and, and it was inspired of God, but he would end it with, you see how big a letter I, I wrote. And theologians believe, and this is just opinion, that when he would, to, to signify the letter was his, that he would write this big letter because he, most people believe he had some eye disease that was kind of left over from that, that thing on the road to Damascus. I can't prove any of that. He's, the Bible says that as far as the apostle, he was nothing to look upon. His voice was not a voice that you'd really want to hear. He was, not the, he, he, he was so thumped on in life that he could have given up, but he kept on going. You got cancer? Keep on going. You have arthritis? Keep on going. You've had financial setback? Keep on going. You have had a broken relationship? Keep on going. Keep on going. Persevere. Persevere. Paul said in 1 Corinthians uh, 9, 16, he says, Woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7, the Bible says that we have this treasure in earthen vessels. I want to tell you something about you. That treasure is identified in verse number four in that chapter. Yes. It is identified as the gospel. Yes. You've got something inside of you. You've got the fullness of the Spirit of God, but that happened at regeneration. What you have inside of you is the knowledge of the death, burial, and resurrection that you accepted, and you're going to heaven because of that. The Bible calls that a treasure down inside of you. And God wants you every day of your life to open up that treasure Amen. and give the treasure to somebody else. Amen. Inscribed, I read, I read this illustration. It was, it was in an article written in the New York Times in 1994. It said that it was inscribed on the wall of the Washington Monument. They uncovered this in 94. They believe it was written somewhere between 1854 and 1880 during the construction phase of the Washington Monument. It said this, quote, whoever is the human instrument under God in the conversion of one soul erects a monument to his own memory more lofty and enduring than this one. Let me read that again. I, 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 unbelievable. On a government building, this was found. I quote, whoever is a human instrument under God in the conversion of one soul erects a monument to his own memory more lofty and enduring than this one. Initials B, F, B. No one has a clue who that was. A construction worker. Anybody ever heard the name Miss Daisy Hoss? She was a Sunday school teacher that Lee Robertson came to Christ under. And the, I uh, can't think of the man, the, it was a shoe salesman uh, that brought Moody to Christ. And that list goes on and on. And some t someone today may go out and win to Christ the pastor of one of these next church plants. Yes. 